Welcome to Buckets, brought to you by BetMGM, the king of sportsbooks. Glad to have you with us. My name is Matt Moore. I'm the senior NBA writer for the Action Network, joined by Sean Little. You can check him out over at MSG Networks and all over the Action Network. Sean, how you doing, my man? You can follow Sean on Twitter at Chicago Flow. How is your offseason treating you as I'm sure you are getting ready, like the rest of us are, for NFL season? Yeah, man, we're winding down. Summer's over. I'm looking forward to getting the NFL kicked off here. And then right before you know it, we'll be watching regular season NBA hoops. I'm looking forward to it. Yep. We've got training camp in like three weeks. I'm not, I'm not prepared at all. I'm not ready. I'm not ready to go back to quote unquote work. I have a lot of work to do between now and the start of, of camp. So there's a lot of stuff for me to get to. Uh, we're going to start this week with our guide to how to bet the awards. We're starting with six man of the year today. Next week, we're going to do coach of the year and defensive player of the year. So make sure to check those out in the feed. Also make sure to check out what our WNBA betting podcast next Tuesday. I'll be hosting a play off preview for that uh if you are somebody that has seen those episodes and has not listened i'm going to encourage you to listen WNBA playoffs really profitable opportunity there's a it's a uh not a chaotic environment but game to game there's a lot of variance and there's a lot of room to get in on some of these spreads uh we'll break down the entire thing next week on walkets you can catch that out check that out on tuesday as well as like i said our coach of the year and defensive player of the year episodes for the nba a couple more housekeeping notes want to let you know that uh this week um the favorites podcast is starting up its picks contest go to the favorites.actionnetwork.com and you can sign up it's free it's favorites.actionnetwork.com not the favorites favorites dot action network.com you can sign up it's free giving away over a hundred thousand dollars in prize money uh weekly winners multiple p- places paid out in the contest check it out sponsored by bet 365 uh five picks a week i've got my picks loaded in there feel really good about them i will feel terrible once we get to the end of the day on sunday i'm absolutely sure but you can go against me find me in there sign up for the favorites Pick them contest at favorites.actionnetwork.com. Also, I want to remind you, Matt, you can find this. Go ahead. What's up? I was going to say really quick. It's actually free, guys. No gimmicks. Action. Weekly money's given out. Season money long. All you have to do is sign up for Action an Action Network account if you don't have one. But no gimmicks. None of that other BS you see across the board. It's actually free. Go, go have some fun this NFL season. Everything we talk about today can be found in the award-winning Action Network app. You can find all of our podcasts in the Action Network app. Great articles, all sorts of great stuff in there as well. You can track picks. You can see all the futures that I bet on the NBA. You can track picks for the WNBA playoffs. Everything in there. Make sure to check that out. Also, make sure you go to YouTube.com slash The Action Network. It's YouTube.com slash The Action Network and find All of our great stuff on there. This show is on there for a video version of the show. Great way to support us is to go to the Action Network YouTube page, click subscribe, turn on notifications, you can catch the live shows. Uh, The Action Network pod, the Sunday six-pack with Stucky and Raybon, did theirs last night. They're going to have the live show for Big Bets on campus. Lots of stuff. All right, housekeeping's out of the way. Let's get into six man of the year. So what we do on these episodes is we want to break down not only give you some picks and we'll have some bets for you at the end as well on who we like this season based off of the analysis but the bigger thing here is let's try and figure out who wins these awards how to bet these awards when to bet these awards these are all key kind of elements as we go through them and sean when i'm i've done the research and and one of the things i think is really interesting is how malcolm brogdon was kind of an outlier performance last year wasn't one of the higher ranking scorers in the league in terms of coming off the bench, only averaged 14.9 points off the bench. The average scoring average for a six man of the year winner over the last 25 seasons, 16.6 points. So he was a full point and a half off of that. But I will say that when I kind of looked at the numbers, it was interesting to me that these numbers were less than I thought they were. I thought this was going to be entirely just a, like a, do you get buckets coming off the bench? Then that's like, who's probably going to win. Not really. Uh, and a lot of that gets into, yes, Tyler Hero won at 21 points a game. And Jordan Clarkson won at 18.4. Uh, Trez Montrez Harrell won at 18.6. Lou Williams was, was 20 and 23 when he won. But there have been guys in there that have, have scored a little bit less. You've got guys like Lou Williams, the first time he won was only 15.5. You've got... 
Uh, guys in there like Lamar Odom at 14.4. Mike Miller back in 2006 won with only 13.7. The bigger thing really is how many games you win. I'll get to that in a second. But when you're starting to look at the market, what's the first thing that you're trying to figure out when you're trying to find opportunity to bet into the six man of the year market? Yeah, overall, too, just on awards in general, I need to have some type of narrative because these are humans that are voting on these awards. You can go back to as recent as Joel Embiid winning the MVP. He had a massive game coming down the stretch there. And Matt, as you know, it was all but signed, sealed, and delivered after that game. No matter what happened after that, it was done, dusted. He was going to get the MVP. But, yeah, you also have to win. I went back. Because, of course, I did since 2005. Matt, you want to know why I went back to 2005? Because, of course, Ben Ben Gordon. I got to give – I got any opportunity I could give love to my my bull Ben Gordon, I will. He won it in 2005. Um, And 18 of the 19 players since then, all playoff playoff guys, all on playoff teams are all winning games, impacting games on playoff teams. The only exception is Lou Williams in 2018 – on the the Doc Rivers-led Clippers team that didn't make the playoffs. But you need to be winning and you need to be coming off of the bench and impacted. So the first thing I'm looking at when I'm looking at six man of the year specifically is, is this guy going to get 27 to 30 minutes a game off the bench? Because historically that's what you've needed to win the award as well. Is he going to score enough? And is he going to impact the game on a winning team? That's the first thing I'm looking at. So typically you could look at the odds board and, and most of those guys are going to be up there broad and quickly. We'll get into a lot of specifics here coming up, but is the guy going to come off the bench, get enough minutes and impact a, a winning playoff team? So the winning part I think is really important. The impact thing I'll disagree with you a little bit on. I don't know that these guys are necessarily the highest impact dudes in the league. Um, and but for that team is more of what I'm getting at. They they are yeah, like yeah, yeah. Lou Williams was so massive for a lot of those teams. Brogdon, he cleaned up a lot of things when he came on the floor for Boston. So yeah, I, I think just team specific, it, it it really really helps. Yeah, and I, and I think this is a blind spot for me because when I talk about impact, it's very rarely do I look at scoring because I, I do tend to like this is a bias of mine that like I I try and accommodate, but it's a big one where I'm just like okay yeah he gets 20 points a game. I know a lot of guys that can get 20 points a game. Like yeah. I've been in the league a while covering it. And so I know like I've seen a lot of dudes come and go that were averaging 20 and they weren't necessarily guys that like helped you win. However, if you're a winning team and you're giving a winning team 20, 20 points a night, if you're getting buckets, that translates to who has won this award. So it doesn't really matter. The key I would say here is, you know, the, we're always going to be a little bit numbers based here. It's a betting podcast. And, and for a number of reasons, I'm pretty analytically forward. I would say that like the, the impact metrics don't translate to who wins this award. And that's okay. Last year. What I think is interesting is that it did is that Brogdon was by every metric, the most impactful six man in the league. If you look at the guys that played enough games coming off the bench, enough minutes and had a big enough usage role the thing that stood out with Brogdon was that he did win in all those impact metrics. He was the best in EPM. He did have the highest win shares, et cetera, et cetera. So like, that's where I think last year may have been an outlier. It could signal a shift this year. If we see that carry through, like if Brogdon wins again with a very similar case, I could see that happening. I will say one of the problems with this award is, how can I put this? We'll talk about wins in a second. This does tend to be a default award some of the time. Like last year, if a dude had come in and had scored 18 to 20 points a game, they probably win it. Like Brogdon's case wasn't strong. It was just kind of, well, I don't have a better guy. And so he winds up winning, you know, quickly got hurt late in the season. And that so that a lot of that momentum tailed off um, for the Knicks. The wins are really fascinating here. So I looked at the last 25 years. Uh, You can't actually look at the average wins per team because you've got two seasons in there that were uh, impacted either by COVID or by the lockout, right? So I looked at just win percentage and we averaged that out. The average 82 game rate of wins. This is extremely high, Sean. It's 53 point. It's 54 wins. It's 53.8. 
that's the average for the number of wins on an 82 game season rate that the six man of the year winner has been on. Now you have like a few outliers in there that are going to push this up. We've got Jamal Crawford um, on a 57 win team. Lander Barbosa was on the 07 Suns, which won 61. Got to love that team. Barbosa was so awesome. Barbosa um, was awesome for them. <laughs> what's also interesting is I, I found that there's only been, if we look at, again, full seasons, there's only been two times that we've had a guy win with fewer than 49 wins. That's crazy to me. You have to get to 49. And for the most part, you need to be at 50 or above. That helps us, I think, when we're looking at preseason value, because when you're looking at a lot of people will start with the numbers, start with the teams. You need to ask yourself, do I think this team can win 50 games? And if they can't, you need to remove them. So there's like a lot of guys that are going to get buckets on teams in the middle pack of 40 to 40 to 50. Like a good example of this would be um, Ben, Ben McMatherin was like in the race for six man of the year last year as a rookie would have been first guy since your guy, Ben Gordon uh, to do so as a rookie. Right. So it only makes sense. If Matherin got buckets last year as a rookie will be better this year. The Pacers are going to be better. Maybe matherin has got value. Do I think that I've got the Pacers extremely high relative to the market? Bet the over. I'm going to bet them again, probably. I've got to bet for them to make the playoffs. Do I think they win 50 games? No. Like, it would be a tail end of a tail end performance if the Indiana Pacers got to 49. So I can't think that that has value. Now, if Indiana pops off in the in the first month of the season, will I start looking at Bennett Matherin? Absolutely. But let's wait and see if we actually get to a place where I'm like, Okay, they're on such a high pace to clear, you know, they can they can tail off considerably and still get to 49. If we get there, I'll start looking at them. But Sean, for me, like this is the starting point is every candidate you're going to look at to bet preseason needs to be 49 wins or more. Absolutely. And it's 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 funny to think about it that way because it seems backwards, right? This is this is purely as you mentioned default, I think it is looked at that way. Like who's coming off the bench and scoring 20 points, we'll give him that award. But if you if you work backwards, like you said, start focusing on teams first. Start looking at rotations and minutes on said team. You can start eliminating some of these people. I think a really interesting – I don't want to give out – I don't want to start giving out picks, but like Josh Hart's down there by like plus 2,500. Yeah. I think he crosses off – a lot of different things that you need to win awards in general. People love his game. It's a big effort game. He's going to, he's going to be a positive impact off the bench in a massive market in New York city. He's going to play 27 to 30 minutes a game for sure. Coming off the summer that he's having on the USA team. He, 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 him and he has a lot of things going for him. Now are the Knicks going to win 50 games? That's when you start to question like maybe that 2,500, is actually just a punt instead of actual value on that number. Now, another thing that's interesting is 17 of the 19 going back to 05 with rookie Ben Gordon winning the award have been guards. Yeah. So this is a guard heavy award as well. We had Montrez Harrell, who look, look, I wrote down who else Montrez Harrell and Lamar Odom in 2011 are the only two guys that haven't been guards since 2005 to win the award. So Matherin, Checks off all the boxes that you're that you're saying, Matt. But then you start to look at the Pacers and are they going to win 50 games? That's when it gets a little spooky. Let's talk a little bit about when to bet this award and the pattern of that, and then we can get into, get into some picks here. So, one of the things that with six man of the year, we've talked a little bit about this. I've gravitated a lot more towards you need to only be betting long shots in preseason. I think that there are very few – I think the season is too long for there to be a lot of value on short odds, folks. In the market, this one's a little bit different in that you do have like the – because it's so uncertain, quickly is the favorite at 7-1. At to one. Brogdon is second at 8-1 to one in the market. So it, that's not short, right? You're not talking about 4-1 to one like you're going to get on some of the MVP stuff. It's still not short enough 
for me or long enough rather for me to think that there's pretty good value on on this now i think you still need to be targeting long shots in particular in preseason the best way i, th I think to go about it and what i'll do is i'm going to look at teams that i think are going to win for that have the capacity not going that i think have the ability to win 49 or more if they have a really great season if everything goes right they get healthy and they perform even some of maybe even some of my expectations start there right and then look at the candidates that are that are a little bit longer amongst those teams when you get into the season there's not there's two things here one i don't think there's a lot of value in this market quite honestly before christmas i think you can wait will you have some indication in december sure i'll also say there have been in, there have been times when this market has moved quickly and then all the value is gone uh 2022 is a wonderful example of this where Tyler Hero came out and was dropping 20 to 25 every game the first four weeks of the season. And by the end of November, over. Like the odds were already minus 800 or longer or shorter rather. And so there are times when you'll just miss on this on this market and you have to kind of accept it. Like I don't think anybody is like, man, I just got to bet on six man of the year. But if you are, be aware that, hey, if you're just like, I really want to get out on this market because I think it's liquid, take your long shots now. And you could, if there's one guy that just absolutely pops, because Hero, you could get at plus 350. We did this over at Action Network on Future Fridays, I wrote about. It was like the after the first two weeks, I was like, you got to bet Tyler Hero for six man right now. This value is going to be gone immediately. And it, it really was. But most years, I think, it's in question, I think, until December because there aren't really great candidates. It's like, okay, yeah. You know, he's scoring a lot, but like, okay, are they, is he going to keep this up? And are they going to be good enough? Are they going to really finish with, with whatever to get there? Um, there are certain cases, and I will say also, we have kind of lost this position a little bit where you had Jamal Crawford and Lou Williams, who obviously won so many, they think they belong in the Hall of Fame. We don't have a lot of just like pure bench bucket getters right now. That's one of the reasons why Brogdon won last year, right? is there aren't a lot of those guys I think across the league that we can kind of identify as like, that's a pure bucket getter. Um, maybe like a bones Highland. You know, I think the Clippers actually have a bunch of interesting dudes. I bet a lot on Norman Powell last year and lost cause he couldn't stay healthy. I think Norman probably wins this award. If the Clippers were able to get their shit together at any point during the season, if Norman stayed healthy and those two things are related, right? Like Norm stays healthy. Maybe the Clippers win more. Maybe the Clippers get up there high enough. And then it's like, well, you know, Brogdon was good, but Norm averaged 18. Pa Let's go ahead and, and Powell's a good defender. Let's give it to Powell. I don't feel bad about that bet necessarily. Um, so I, but I do think that it took me until December to start really identifying candidates. The other thing I would say is NBA.com will put out an article around Christmas that's a GM survey. They'll do a league survey of executives that talk about like, who do you think should win and they'll do a media one as well. Brogdon led in, there was only one poll for the non MVP awards last year. Bon Temps does the MVP poll. There was only one poll for the other awards last year. It said at mid season, it was Brogdon. Brogdon was ahead comfortably in that award. And so it kind of gave us an indication, at least of an anchoring bias where I don't think anybody late in the season did enough. Like quickly is a good example of this. No one did enough to get past where Brogdon had already established himself because the Celtics absolutely whipped ass that first two months of the season. They were incredible, best offense in the league, et cetera. So Sean, for me, I'm not, you know, I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth here. Where I'm like, well, wait, you're saying that the value could be gone in the first two weeks of the season, but you should wait until December. I am saying the first two weeks, really valuable. You're going to learn a lot in those first two weeks. If you have not decided on a, oh, he's very clearly going to win, then I think you can wait until late December, January 1st, and start looking at the market. Another example is Jaron Jackson Jr. Early in the season, it was Jaron Jackson Jr.'s winning defensive player of the year. As long as he stays healthy, he was able to do that. There was a lot of smoke coming from Brooke Lopez. I think that was just a lot of gas. I think it was always going to be Jaron Jackson Jr. Uh, but you mentioned quickly, at one point, Quickly was the favorite coming down the stretch. That's how impactful some of these national TV games for yeah. big teams in big markets impact these storylines. So there, there 
you can all it, it's things can flip very quickly in a lot of these markets as well. You put together a weak stretch. It went from Brogdon as a lock to quickly has a real shot to now Brogdon's back to being a lock. So you kind of the if you feel like you missed the market, continue to pay attention. You might get another opportunity. Also, I don't know. We were talking about off the bench bucket getters, Matt. Maybe you've never heard of Kobe White, but look out. 20, 2023, 2024. You you might meet another one, but we, we don't have to we don't have to go down that road. But yes, there the 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 thing about Lou Will and what made him such a sixth perennial six man guy, along with Jamal Crawford, is they accepted that role. They 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 flourished. They loved that role. Let me come off the bench and just absolutely murder these second rotation guys because in my eyes and across the league, people know I could probably start no problem. But I'm so impactful off the bench and I can get some hardware out of this. So they accepted that role and came off the bench. I think that is part that, that that's the part uh, that need the player needs to be uh they want to ha- they they want to they have to want to be the sixth man. I think Brogdon also accepted that role when he came over for Boston. So keep your eye on the market. They do flip, but Hero's a good example, Jaron Jackson Jr is a good example. If you feel like you can fade the injury bug, there's still hey, even though Tyler Hero may have been plus 5 600 before the season, if you can get him at plus 125 plus 130, there's still value there because that, like Matt laid out, that award was done, dusted very early on. Yeah. Uh, all right. So let's talk about some some best bets here for this award uh, in preseason. And we'll do another awards best bet closer to the season. You'll get a lot of best bets here on buckets before the season starts. But let's talk about some of them. So for me, I'll talk about process here for a minute. Uh, the tough part for me is that I've only got currently, I only have four, uh, five teams. I have five teams with 50 wins or more next season. The Boston Celtics, and you're talking about Brogdon at 8-1, to one, coming off a major injury, not a high-level scorer, never really trusts his health issues. Brogdon's just got a lot of health issues, so don't love that bet. The Cleveland Cavaliers are my second-best team in the league, and there's not a really good candidate here either. I don't have one. Like, Do I think like Max Struess, is he going to suddenly turn into like an 18 points per game score? Like, probably not. Right? Niang, probably not. They don't – you could talk – you could talk yourself into using this logic, Karis Levert, hard pass for me. I'm I'm good. I'm good on Karis Levert, too inconsistent. Levert's a guy where if we see him in the first two weeks of the season and it's like, oh, Karis has really leveled up and like he's having a phenomenal season, I'm still going to be like, oh, God, but uh, maybe I'll look at betting it and we can cross that bridge when we get there. Uh, I've got the heat if they were to get Dame at this threshold. But again, I don't see a guy coming off the bench that's going to be able to do so. Make Caleb Martin it, it is in the market here if you buy into the ECF performance. He's 22 to 1. That one's not bad. I don't love it because Caleb was such a, a weird outlier. But Caleb might be one that I look at and if they do get the Dame deal done and Caleb doesn't start and we get in the first two weeks of the season, and it's like, oh, the Heat are a juggernaut, and Martin's scoring 15 a game. I will start to look at Caleb Martin immediately. So if, you, if you're if you just like, I believe in the Heat, they're going to whip ass with Dame, this is going to be incredible, Caleb Martin is probably like a not bad bet there. You don't want to get Tyler Hero in this situation because you do have no idea where he's going to be, what position he's going to play. You don't know if he's going to start if he doesn't get traded. Uh, there's there's no way I think to, to bet on him, but Caleb Martin twenty two to one is maybe the first one that I, I on this list that I I kind of look at. Um, from there, uh, I have the Sixers still over fifty. I don't think Maxi comes off the bench. That's without Harden, by the way. Um, I don't think Maxi comes off the bench. I think Maxi starts. I don't think DeAnthony Melton, who I've bet before for six man of the year, will ever put up enough, enough numbers. He's not consistent enough, so I can't get there. There's no one really on the Sixers I can buy into as the guy to to kind of to kind of get at home there. Paul Reed's a little bit interesting, but I never think he'll score enough. And like you said, this has been do- dominated by guards. Memphis is the other team, and I don't have a candidate for them. Like Santi Aldama is uh, kind of the nominal six man. Even when Jaw gets back, there's a chance that the lineup is. Ja, Smart, Bain, Jaron, Adams. Luke Kennard might be a play for me. Like, I, I might look at that. He's 
50 to one. That's a, uh, I think is a pretty good long shot for a guy that has an absolute green light is going to shoot the lights out of the ball has to play because of their defensive issues or their offensive issues rather will probably, I think still come off the bench even before jaw gets back. There is like a small chance that what they do is they flip it and they go jaw, canard, Bain, Jaron, Adams, right? When jaw comes back, that might be the case, in which case smart then has value. Um, Memphis is, is maybe the team that I look at and go, we have some options here at Kennard at 50 to one, maybe taking the Marcus smart as a backup flyer on it. It's essentially like, do you think how much, do, how good do you think Memphis is going to be? And I think Memphis is going to be really good even with the jaw suspension. So those are, are kind of my top level guys. We'll talk about some of the, the deeper cuts here of guys that teams I think that can get there, but those are the only teams that I've got at 49 or more right now. Listen, we talked about, you have to be a playoff team. You have to, you're, you're right around that 49 win mark. So if you're going to take that hook, line, and sinker and, and, and make that a completely hard cutoff, then it, it does close your window enough. Now, I, I'm not opposed to, to looking at a team that's going to have 46, 47, potentially 48 wins, make the playoffs, and have a guy coming off the bench making an impact. And that's why I'm looking at Malik Monk right now. Hmm. He is plus 1,500. The Kings had 48 wins last year. Are they going to regress a little bit? Most likely. We'll, we'll see how that shakes. We'll see how seriously they take the regular season. I think they will take it very, very seriously and try to continue to put together what they've been doing out in Sacramento in the beam. And they got a good thing going out there. I think they continue to do that. So I like Malik Monk at plus 1,500. He averaged just under 14 points a game last year. If he doesn't make a leap to 17, 18 points a game this year, I would be shocked. He was awesome in the playoffs, very confident, came in. We know he can shoot it. And I was looking at his numbers compared to a guy, Mr. Six Man, like Lou Williams, and they're somewhat similar overall for their career. Both are around like 42 and a half, 43% from the floor, Right around 36% is Malik Monk from three. So these guys, if, if Malik can start getting to the rack a little bit as well, I think that would be, to the, to the free throw line rather, uh, that would be impactful as well. But I would be shocked if Malik Monk didn't make that leap and, and get into that 17 point to 20 point window a game coming off the bench. And um, I like him at plus, at, at plus 1,500. Yeah, so I mean, the problem is the Kings had the best injury luck in the league last season, and yeah. I only, based off of those projections on my power rating, I, I still only have them at 46 wins, right? So they overperformed yeah. last It's going to be close, so I, right? Right, and like 46 to 49 is doable. I should note that I, I mentioned those teams are the only ones at 49 or more. Those are the teams I've got 50 or more. In the 49 range, I do have the Bucks, the Nuggets, um, the Suns, all in that category, there's not a candidate on the Suns. They are going to stagger their starters too much, so you're not going to get the usage. Like Beal or Booker or KD will always be on the floor, and they will always suck up a huge amount of usage in those situations. The Bucks, I'm just down on in general. Like Bobby Portis is, is always going to be up there. He kind of hangs around the six-man conversation every year. It's possible that this is the year that he gets it, 15-1, to 1, but I don't love it. I just We talked about the guards, and mostly this is like, I just don't think the Bucks are going to have that good of a season. I'm lower on them. I've already bet the under. Um, so I, I can't endorse that kind of a play. <sighs> Monks, I think, is a really good candidate from a from a scoring perspective. That is simply a, if you're listening to this and you're like, well, I disagree with Matt, I think they're going to be closer to 48. If you're just like, I think, you know, I'll put them in for 47, 48. The Monks, absolutely a really good play, right? If you're, if you're at that level, I have concerns about the King's regression. I, I don't know how far I'm going to get to with them in terms of how I'm going to approach betting them. They're probably just going to be a stay away from me in most of the market, you know, and look, we disregarded them last season when we talked about the Pacific D division winners and they wound up winning it. And we got great. I was talking about it mid season. I was like, why are we not just betting the Kings to win the division? They're keep getting undervalued by the market because the market doesn't believe in them and versus all these other teams. Maybe that's the case here, but mine is very much based off of like how they actually played. I got a lot of reasons to, to not kind of go in there. Um, you mentioned Josh Hart, and I think that him and Quickly are really interesting. Now, Quickly is too short to me at 7-1. to one. I just I can't get there on 
betting a seven to one preseason on quickly. Yeah. Uh, Hart's really interesting at 25 and I've got the Knicks at 46, but I think that their ceiling is, is probably closer to 52. I think that 46, like I think 44, 52 is probably their range. It's going to be a wide range. Uh, but I think that the, the high end performance of them, and I like them quite a bit gets them there. I've talked a lot about, well, one caveat to the heart discussion is we don't know what's going to happen with Joel Embiid. I've talked about on the show before that if Embiid asks out, I believe that the Knicks deal will get done pretty shortly. Like I think it will be a quick turnaround KD like situation where they resolve the Harden thing and Embiid asks out and B gets moved to the Knicks in short order. They have picks, they have assets, they have young guys. Does Hart get thrown in that deal? Possibly. Does quickly get thrown in that deal? Possibly. So you might have a situation where these guys, that value will completely dry up, but you're also banking on a very major trade involving a guy that has a lot of reasons to stay in Philly leaving. So I, I still think you're right. The question I kind of think is, do you feel like Josh Hart can get the production value up there enough for him to be in this conversation versus quickly, who I think we kind of know is going to do that. I just don't know if quickly is going to wind up starting more this season. Yeah, I agree. And if Josh Hart does end up winning this award, it would, it would be an outlier on the scoring piece as well. He's going to be doing a lot of other things defensively impacting the game, rebounding all, all types of stuff outside of scoring that would it would be a lot of narrative driven stuff here if Josh Hart were to win it at 25 to 1. I'll say this, if that Joel Embiid thing does does perk up and become actually real, I I believe quickly and RJ would get moved. They are, they are the 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 biggest pieces in the package. The the relationship between Brunson and Hart I think is a lot a, a, a big, big deal with how well it went last year. I'm going to make Kennard a play because I think he's the most likely to come off the bench. Uh, I have two more. I'm going to give out his best bet. So Luke Kennard is going to be my best bet. And then the other two are going to be just signed yesterday. Christian Wood, 30 to one Los Angeles Lakers. Now we've talked about the guards and, and you're like, but Matt, we just talked about the guards. Christian Wood would have won six man of the year if the Mavericks weren't morons. Like, <laughs> here's the thing. Uh, I I don't think uh, Christian Wood makes you a better basketball team. So we talk about impact. I don't think Christian Wood makes you a better basketball team. But does he do the thing that Sean was talking about, where for a really good team, he winds up playing a big part and that gets attributed, like he gets attributed success? I think so. Like there's two other Lakers here on this list, which I think is really fascinating. And you can tell the market's a little behind here and doesn't know what to do because Christian Woods, 30 to one, Rui Hachimura is 31 and Reeves is 30 to one. Do I see any scenario where Reeves is coming off the bench again? I don't, I think he's starting. They've already set, like there's been a report from Dave McMenamin of ESPN that Rui's going to start. So we know Woods coming off the bench. We know Wood was extremely productive last year for the Mavericks when his minutes weren't getting jerked around by Jason Kidd. I don't want to present Wood here as like a victim, okay? Wood does not play winning basketball, okay? He's selfish. He plays offense only. He's terrible defensively. And maybe Darvin Ham does not play him as a result of those defensive issues. I kind of think he does because I think they're going to need production. I think their defense is going to be good enough, but their offense is going to struggle. And he's going to get that little boost of starting when Anthony Davis is out. Wood's the most likely replacement starter for AD. So if AD is out, then it seems very likely to me that that goes in that direction. Um, where this does get tough, though, is, okay, if Rui's starting and AD is starting, and I think LeBron James is going to start – Right. We're we're now down to just two spots. AD has said he doesn't want to play center. OK, so is it Reeves at point guard? One of the centers. AD, LeBron and Rui. Like, I don't know how this kind of work, works out, but I will say that ultimately I still think that Christian Wood at 30 to one is probably good value. Now, I have the I have the Lakers a little bit lower. I think they're being a little bit overestimated in the market based off of last season's success. But I also think you talk about narrative. Who doesn't love a Laker? 
Sean, who doesn't love a Laker when you're voting for these things. So uh, I will, I think Christian would have to be a best bet at 30 to one. Yeah. I mean, I listen, I would, it is very difficult to win any of these awards, not being on national TV and not being talked about on a daily basis, whether it be on TV, Twitter, wherever else. So the, the, the biggest that that was the biggest shock for me when I saw SGA on first team, first team, uh, all NBA. It was like, wow, people were really paying attention because he deserved to be first team all NBA. I just said, there's no way that they'll give it. They'll give him that slot being in that market and being maybe a year away from where this coming season, we're really talking about him being in the NBA MVP talk. So that was one outlier for me where I was like, I was shocked to see him in the first team. It wasn't because he didn't deserve it. It was because typically the, the narrative and the story around guys uh, needs to be a lot stronger than it was for SGA. So, yeah, who doesn't love a Laker? Who doesn't love a Nick? That's why I'm looking at uh, Malik Monk and that Josh Hart at 25 to 1. Uh, one more for you. Before we get out of here, I will say that I would love to bet Sadiq Bay, but I think he's either going to wind up starting or I don't think the Hawks will win enough games. So Sadiq Bay, I, lo- I love as like a, a profile of this player, but there's too much uncertainty. He will be a name I'll be looking at once the season starts. The other guy, this is kind of a long shot for sure. Uh, Josh Green for the Dallas Mavericks. So I'm, I'm pretty bullish on the Mavericks overall. I think they're going to be – a really good team this season. Uh, all of my caveats and, and issues and qualms with Kyrie Irving, not only on court, uh, but off court, all kind of, to me, lead in, in a direct, like, they're all beside the point. I still think this team's going to win a lot of games. They had a Grant Williams, who's also on this list. Um, they had Seth Curry. But I think Josh Green takes a leap here. He averaged nine points a game last season. So do I think that he can get to 15? Yes, I do. Uh, I think there's a very good chance that Green winds up having a brogdon s case if the mavericks win 52 or more wins which i think is doable with the talent and having luka Doncic, a top five player in the league if they wind up winning 52 games and josh green is playing a big role off the bench which i think he is some of his stuff got really weird last season after the trade like they de-emphasized him i'm hopeful that with another year kid will not kid and and just do the sensible thing and play him more and if Green plays enough, I think his advanced metrics will get him here and his projection will tick up just enough to get him in Brogdon range. And so at 30 to 1, I do like Josh Green for the Dallas Mavericks. Yeah, I, I can't complain. I love his game. And he just needs to get on Jason Kidd's side, and then it could be it could be a real live ticket. Matt, do we have any uh do we have any odds on Rondé Hollis Jefferson anywhere? Is it, has, bet, has bet MGM hung those anyway? <laughs> Maybe we need to start looking at those. The, we we'll probably have getting... most improved. We we'll probably have to be most improved player, I would think, after yeah. considering he was out of the league. That that's not a bad idea if he does get signed. Um, all right, let's go wrap it up for buckets for a Tuesday. Thanks for joining us, or Thursday rather. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate you guys being with us. My thanks to David Payne, our producer. Uh, my thanks to Sean Little for joining me. Thanks to our video producers as well for putting this up on YouTube. Make sure you go to youtube.com slash the action network. We'll see you guys again next week for coach of the year and defensive play of the year. Enjoy the launch of NFL season. We'll see you guys again next time. Until then, let's get buckets.